All right. Today we're going to get into um, responsive web design. And our first, um, first iterations of this is going to be an entirely HTML CSS solution. So there's not going to be any scripting involved neither client nor server-side scripting. It will be entirely done via HTML and CSS. Margin after that, or whatever. 
Then that has the flexibility, you could apply a different style sheet with a different margin. Whereas if you put the break tags in, you're locked in to that. All right. So this is where we're going. And I'm first going to consider these two things because these two things are largely review. If you had 216 with me, we, we covered this. We probably also covered fixed layouts, but we did talk about this. This one I don't think we talked about, but it's not really that hard. All right, so we can kind of cover that. It's almost like review. All right, if we didn't cover it before, it shouldn't be a big shock to you how it works. So we're going to do these two first in an example, and then we're going to move on to incorporate the media queries. Um, before I begin, with the example though, I want to talk about two general strategies as far as developing a page or a set of pages that works both on a desktop environment and on a mobile, uh, mobile environment. One of them is called graceful degradation. Sounds weird and sounds like a contradiction or whatever, but we'll analyze what that means. And the other is called progressive enhancement. With graceful degradation, you assume your starting point is the full blown site for a high end desktop machine. And then you chip stuff away to make it work for mobile. All right? So with graceful degradation, your starting point, more or less, is a completed website, completed, you know, full feature for a desktop. And then you chip away from that to come up with a site that's appropriate for mobile. Because what do we know about mobile design? Mobile designs typically all the way around are going to be simpler, right? Um, for any number of reasons. Why is it a good idea to make mobile sites simpler than desktop sites? Uh, for one, it's like you, you might not have the person's attention. You, you kind of want to get to the point, maybe. Okay, number one, if we remember back to user goals, yeah. people uh, accessing a site uh, via um, a mobile site are, are typically after quick answers as opposed to going in and immersing themselves in a website. You don't have the screen size. You don't, you don't have, the have the screen, screen size. size. All right, so two columns might look great on a desktop, but two columns on a mobile device probably isn't going to look any good. Any other reason why you might want a simpler site? Okay. Just input device. Yeah, the input device limitations. The other thing would be bandwidth, right? I mean, um, Typically, people are going to have a slower connection uh, than they would um, on, on a desktop machine. So for all these reasons, simpler is, is better when it comes to mobile. Now, simple is good when it comes to desktop sites, too, right? But we're taking that to an even higher degree when we talk about mobile sites. So the notion of graceful degradation is we start with a full site, and then we chip away and get rid of stuff until it's appropriate for mobile. All right. We chip away, we get rid of stuff, we reformat stuff, and so on. Progressive enhancement is sort of the opposite. With progressive enhancement, we start out with a bare bones site appropriate for your grandmother, who I don't know, but I'm assuming, has a very old flip phone, all right, that doesn't have a high-end smartphone, that has the most basic sort of flip phone functionality you have. And then we progressively add stuff in for more and more featured devices. So in one, we start with complete all the bells and whistles and trim it down. The other, we start with bare bones and expand it out. Each of these are valid approaches, I would say, depending on the circumstances. What I would say sort of, though, more than likely is if I already had a website, if, you know, www.myrestaurant.com already had a desktop version of their website, and they came to me and said, 
make a mobile website. Well, they already got a website, right? So I would probably look in terms of graceful degradation to take what they have and trim it down so it's appropriate for a mobile device. Whereas if a brand new organization came to me and says, we need to create a website and we also want the website to work well on a mobile device, I would probably take the strategy of progressive enhancement, starting with a bare bones website and then enhance it to be more fully featured. So we use the same techniques regardless. It's just that you'll see a little bit, there's a little bit different in how those techniques get manifested and how those techniques use. We're still going to do the same thing. We're still going to be flexible with things. We're still going to use uh, flexible grids, flexible layouts, um, and uh, media queries, but we sort of go in a different direction. One, we include more stuff. The other, we exclude stuff. So to review the first two things that were on the list before, all right, flexible images and flexible design, let's look at this example that I have posted. I actually posted an example in advance on Angel. A couple times this semester, when I'm really on the ball, I will post an example before class. You guys have already gotten it once this term, so probably it'll probably be a long time before it happens again. All right? <laughs> but it always pays sometimes. It always pays sometimes, yeah. It sometimes pays to go out in Angel and check just to see if I posted an example, because then if you want to, you can get sort of a head start revealing it. Now the example I posted, I actually posted two folders, a graceful degradation and a progressive enhancement. For starting out, I'm, I, I took the progressive, I'm sorry, I took the graceful degradation one and sort of made a, uh, a, 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 an alternate version of it. And that's what we're going to start out with. And here's a page. And notice that it's flexible. So as I make it bigger and smaller, these two columns at least move. This column doesn't move. All right. And notice that the image also resizes itself. It resizes to a certain point. All right, notice that at a certain point, the column stops getting any smaller. And notice again, when we cross a different threshold, that column drops down underneath. Finally, at a very narrow screen, we have this. Do keep in mind, my examples are meant to be examples to illustrate certain points. My examples are not meant to be held up as the pinnacle of great web design. Right, but I, I, I do the examples deliberately to um, illustrate certain points. So that's, in a nutshell, how this works. And we'll look at the code, we'll look at the CSS in a minute. One thing I want to do, though, prior to that, is I want to open this up on a mobile device. Well, how do I do that? Well, if we have a server, we could put it out on the server, and then I could go access it um, through my mobile device. And we'll do that later on in the semester. But for now, there's a nice little emulator, the Opera Mobile Emulator, that allows you to, to, to emulate a variety of mobile devices. So I will open up the Opera Mobile Emulator. And I'm going to emulate a real low-end guy, an HTC Hero. So I can just drag my page onto that. And that's what it looks like on a mobile device. Not really that good. All right. So this is flexible, but clearly we don't, we don't have all the pieces in place because um, this doesn't look good. All right. So let's look at what we do have as far as this. Let's look first at the HTML and secondly at the CSS. One thing you'll notice right off the bat with the CSS is we actually have two CSS files. 
All right. These lines through here, oops, from 10 through 15, are lines that I put in for HTML5 compatibility. All right. We all know how, or we, I, we at least have an idea of how it works between developing specifications and browsers. A new specification comes out, and they're working on it. All right. And as they're working on it, browser makers start introducing some of the features into their browsers. Well, they don't necessarily get all of them introduced in their browsers, and they certainly go, don't go back in time to correct old versions of the browsers to accommodate <coughs> HTML5. So you might have someone running IE7 that doesn't know beans about HTML5. All right? So what do you do as a developer? Do you wait until the whole world has HTML5 <coughs> compatible browsers? Well, that's going to be a long way. All right? So what you do instead is you try to accommodate for that. And there's actually a couple very quick fixes that you can put in your code that makes the web browsers at least get the basics of HTML5 right. All right? Really, the biggest thing different about HTML5 is we introduced, not we, but they introduced a number of other containers. Back in HTML4, the div tag was like your tag to group stuff together. That was your container. So you had a div for your navigation. You had a div for your heading. You had a div for your footer. You had your div for the content area. Okay? In HTML5, they fine-tune that a little bit. So instead of having a div for your navigation, they've introduced a new container tag, which is called the nav. So there's a nav tag now that you put your main navigation in. Also in HTML5, there is a heading tag, header tag. I always get that wrong. Header tag. There's also a footer tag in HTML5. And then there's a tag for articles. Now, these are all like div tags, but they're sort of specialized div tags. So you should use them where appropriate. So an HTML4 programmer might have a web page that has four divs, one for the nav, one for the head header, one for the main content, one for the footer. An HTML5 programmer will have one header tag, one nav tag, maybe one article tag, and then finally one footer tag. Now, these are block tags. They're just like divs, all right? The problem is, is web browsers, when they don't understand a tag, what do they do? Pardon me? Not if they don't understand a tag. They just ignore it. So, er earlier versions of Firefox, earlier versions of... Internet Explorer, if you had an HTML5 document that had a nav or had whatever, it just ignores them. Um, those fans of Arrested Development, all right, um, it's like Lucille Bluth who says, I don't understand the question and I'm not going to respond to it. All right? The browser says the same thing. I don't understand the tag and I'm not going to do anything about it. Well, the two fixes that we have in here make the browser understand those HTML5 tags. And the Firefox one is pretty simple. The Internet Explorer fix, we're going to have to sort of take on faith, all right, because it's kind of involved. What's in the Firefox CSS file? All it is, is it tells, hey, these new tags that you don't know about, treat them like they're block tags. So if you put them in your code, then, you know, Firefox now knows, hey, a header is supposed to be a block tag. So that fixes compatibility issues with um, Firefox. The Internet Explorer one is a little trickier. The Internet Explorer one is actually a chunk of JavaScript.
that does something. Well, we can even see what it does if we look closely enough. It actually looks for articles, asides, figures, captions, and sticks in a little embedded style via JavaScript to make the display block. So it does the same thing. So what's the bottom line here? All right. The bottom line here is these lines of code tell older browsers, older versions of Firefox and older versions of Internet Explorer, the basics about some of the new HTML5 tags. Doesn't magically make them HTML5 compatible. Doesn't get rid of all compatibility issues or, or implement completely HTML5. But at the very least, your main new tags for layout, such as the nav, the header, the footer, etc., are going to be handled correctly as block tags. Yes? Do Google Chrome and Safari, are they essentially just more with it, which is why there aren't fixes for them? Um, the Firefox one would actually work. I said Firefox, but it actually would work with older versions of Safari and all that, too. In, in the web development world, there's the one, there's a browser's built off the Mozilla spec and then there is Internet Explorer. So the Firefox fix actually fixes any Mozilla-based browser. So it's probably um, incorrect to call it um, Firefox. Mozilla fix would probably be a better fix. And yeah, as far as uh, uh, HTML5 support, typically Google Chrome does have the best HTML5 support. At least that's been my experience. Okay, so. These lines of code will be in every project you turn in, all right? So make sure these lines of code are in every project you turn in, all right? So now let's look at the page proper. I have my header, I have my nav, and I have my two sections. Let's look at the CSS. <coughs> Header, I have a width of 100%, float left, and I put a border around it. I know the borders aren't necessarily aesthetically pleasing. I put them on there so it's clear you know, where, where, where that element is on the page. The navigation, I give a width of 18%, float it left also, and set a minimum width of 150 pixels. All right? We said that we're not going to use anything fixed, and we're not. But it is appropriate to use minimum widths, because we want it, we don't want it to get smaller than a certain amount, no matter what it's being displayed on. Is everyone familiar with the float? Can someone explain to me how the float works? Let's, uh, what, when block elements line up, uh, if you float something, it will automatically try to like move like to the left. I don't know okay. if I'm explaining it right. That, that's know, a good, that's a good I start. I don't know it, I'm it is hard to verbalize, yeah, all right, but that's I, I a good start. It. I just don't know how to explain it. But it's almost like a gravitational pull to one direction or the other. Okay. Anyone want to add to that? I could be off, but I thought that if, like, let's say the header was less than 100% and you floated them both left, don't they both end up on the top? Right. Um, all those things you're saying uh, are true. With floating, what it's going to do is it's going to try to move an If you float to the left, that's going to be our assumption here. If I float to the left, it's going to try to move that element, that block, next to the element on its left, if it fits on that line. All right? So, for example, this header has a width of 100%, right? So, nothing is going to fit next to it because it's taking up the full width of that. If I were to make this maybe 
50% and save it. Now the navigation is there because this takes up 50%. This now can fit alongside it with it to the left, with the first one to the left. It can fit it alongside of it. So it does. So essentially the browser does that. All right. And when the window's resized, it re redoes that, recalculates that. That's what gives the liquid aspect of it, of the, of the fact that the window will change, or, or the content will change and float around depending on the size of the window. Yeah? In the book, when they had the three column uh, layout, they had float left on the left column, uh -huh. and then float right on the right column with the, the, the center, the main div in the middle. Mm -hmm. Is that like something that I should have been doing all along because most of the time I will just, especially if they're equal sizes in three columns, I'll just float all of the columns to the left. So when it's I size. typically always float columns to the left as well. That's like a, you know, that's a six of one, half dozen the other. You it know, is. It's just, okay. you know, just a personal preference on, on what makes sense to you. That's generally the way I prefer to do it, is to, is to flow on the left. It, it, it makes more sense to me. Okay, so let's make sure we understand the behavior. The nav has a width of 18%, but it will never get smaller than 150 pixels. The two things with a class of part have a width of 30%, but with a minimum width of 200 pixels. Now, for now, let's forget about the, the border, because that, that'll mess up our math. Know that that also comes into play as well. But essentially, when this window gets smaller than 550 pixels, plus change, plus a little bit for the borders, then they're no longer going to be able to fit that second part. If you, look, if you remember looking at the... looking at the HTML, the two sections have a class of part. When this gets to be narrower than 550, Save everything, get back to where we were. When this gets narrower than 550, all right, plus, again, actually is probably like, well, whatever, but the border comes into play too. When it gets narrower than that, boom, that drops down. Finally, when this gets narrower, than 350 is going to drop down again because we won't be able to fit the navigation and the first part next to it. I put an overflow of auto on it so it will expand to be however whatever size it needs. I don't, strictly speaking, know if that's necessary. And the one thing I do is the image that's in part one, I make the width 95%. So, the image in part one, I make to be 95%. So if we look here, that's why if we look at this, it gets smaller as the window gets smaller. And again, 95%, 95% of what? 95% of the container. So this is part of that section that has an ID of part one. So this takes up a certain size, a uh, minimum width of 200, I think, but 30% or a minimum width of 200, this will be 95% of that. 